In this video, I'd like to discuss some design concepts and ideas. I've come up with uh, carbon fiber tail booms for a variety of airplane designs, including a discus launch glider, a heavy duty tail boom pusher, a pylon racer fast plane, and a motor glider. These designs rely on uh, carbon fiber tubing from Radical RC, which I've enjoyed very much and uh, have some benefits of being more streamlined than a traditional foam board uh, tail uh, and somewhat lighter as well, but with a little bit added complexity. However, the design challenges are somewhat enjoyable once you get over some of the hurdles, so I'd like to talk about some of those that I've learned from my own experience. Radical RC is actually a full service RC hobby store with a brick and mortar shop and a great online store with lots of cool stuff, but on this video I'd like to focus on the carbon fiber tubes that I like to get from them. Um, starting with the six millimeter round cross section, and each of these is 40 inches long or one meter, which is a uh, value better than and advantageous in many ways over carbon arrow shafts and other shorter ones. Uh, this six millimeter uh, diameter is uh, four dollars and is about 20 grams. It's a little bit flexible, but it's very light and great for discus launch gliders and lighter planes for a spar. The 7.5 millimeter of uh, spiral round, a spiral wound tube. Um, is about six dollars uh, and it's a good all-around go-to for medium-sized planes for spar and a tail boom. The eight millimeter is quickly becoming my go-to for both purposes spar and tail boom. Uh, it is 28 grams and is nine dollars. Um, it's extremely stiff and as with most quality carbon fiber tubing is uh, nearly indestructible and therefore a tube like this is good for the lifespan of your hobby so it can be recycled through many different planes. And then there is the 10 millimeter round tube, which is $10, uh, 46 grams, but it is obscenely stiff. Uh, good for a pretty, pretty big planes within the foam board building realm that Experimental Airlines uses. Uh, this is about as big a spar as you would need. Now they do have square cross-section tubes, both with a round and a square interior dimension uh, for each of these diameters, and these cost about half again more from the prices I gave for the square outer, square inner and about twice as much for the square outer round interior. Now this has the advantage, despite the cost, of being easier to align the fuselage and the tail feathers. One of the nicest things about Radical RC is they have $3 flat rate shipping for long stock items like this in the United States. And if you've ever shipped or received anything long uh, and bulky like this, you'll know that the shipping is usually more like $15 or $20. So three bucks allows you to get you know, a couple of extra pieces almost as if they were for free. Now for a long time I used uh, carbon arrow shafts uh, because that's really just what I knew from um, ha doing archery as a kid uh, and I thought they were economical. As it turns out in comparison to Radical RC they're really not that uh, economical. They're usually about five or six dollars each but bought in a pack of six and you have to remove the fletching, the knock, the insert, and the tip. Um, but the real reason why I've kind of stopped liking this is they're really quite flexible without much effort. I'm able to bend that. So maybe okay for a kind of a light plane, um, but I wouldn't trust it to anything heavily loaded without struts. Uh, also, this is only 32 inches long. So taking into account the amount of material you get. Conversely, the eight millimeter tube from Radical RC is 40 inches long, which is a meter. And it's hard to depict this on video, but I'm bending this just about as hard as I can to get not even half the flex that I got with the uh, with the arrow shaft here. So uh, that's a consideration for stiffness and economy. Also integral to all the designs I'll show you here, in addition to the Radical RC carbon fiber tubing, is this what I believe to be a polycarbonate corner guard, which I've gotten from Home Depot for less than five dollars for the one and an eighth inch type here, and about three dollars for this five eighths inch. And what this is, is just essentially an angle stock made of this uh, relatively stiff plastic. It's a little bit bendy, which is advantageous for some of the design uh, implications that I'll show you in a moment. Having uh, one or of both of these is uh, helpful as you build your plane. The principal challenge in engineering the carbon fiber tail boom uh, type airplane is the interfacing of a thin round rod or tube in this case, uh, I'm using the round, not the square, to the otherwise flat and broad surfaces of your vertical and horizontal stabilizer and of your fuselage pod. Also, uh, small flat objects like servos here need to be somehow meaningfully attached and securely attached to your round tube. I will address these in the video progressively from the fuselage attachment 
the servo attachment, the pushrod guide, and the horizontal and vertical stabilizer. Starting from the front of the assembly, we have the challenge of joining our tail boom, uh, which is thin and rigid and round if you're using round tube, to a flat and otherwise unreinforced fuselage pod like this. Now you could put a couple of zip ties around this with a gift card and call it good, but I would not really trust that to the forces incurred during flight. Uh, a solution I've worked out is this concept of a joining plate to interface the fuselage pod with the tail boom here. The basic design for that is a piece of a thin, rigid, and light material, and this example is G10 FR4. It's a fiberglass uh, product impregnated with an epoxy or resin, and it's a 1.5 millimeters in this uh, particular type here, and it comes in a variety of thicknesses. This one seems reasonably rigid and light. Carbon fiber sheet is another option, a bit more expensive, extremely rigid, 1.5 or 2 millimeters is good for that. Or if what you have is some thin aluminum or steel plate like this, I wouldn't recommend going over about two millimeters. This is somewhat heavier and a little bit less rigid, uh, but it's much more uh, accessible to most folks. And the basic design requires cutting uh, three separate tabs. Uh, the outer ones are for engaging the rubber bands for mounting the wing to the fuselage and the pods of the fuselage cut symmetrically on both ends. And this can be done with a miter saw very carefully to rough these out and then a Dremel to finish off and smooth off the inner corners here and here, here and here. And then finally, uh, a sand with some ordinary sandpaper on the outsides just to smooth off these corners. And I do like to taper the forward section of the uh, joining plate, as you'll see in this example, as to provide some clearance against the side wall of the fuselage tube to allow the rubber bands to go around. The uh, tail boom itself is joined to the joining plate with placement of uh, zip ties or safety wire or similar means in two locations here. And ultimately, once the joining plate and the wing are aligned with the tail of the plane, uh, this can be uh, fixed with uh, dribbling a little bit of CA glue right there. I do recommend at first constructing this just tentatively with the joining plate in place, with the zip ties and the ability to rotate this, which will allow you to build the tail, get that all aligned, then mount it on the plane and rotate this ever so slightly as you need to to get it perfectly aligned. Then you can uh, put a few spots of CA glue uh, down in the crack just to uh, prevent it from torquing around. So the way that this is assembled into your fuselage pod, which here is the photon with my uh, AMA and FA number dutifully attached, and the uh, dimensions of the joining plate, should, the width should match the inner dimension of the fuselage pod the distance between the uh, tab gaps here and here should equal that of the cord of your wing minus the ailerons, of course, because only the airfoil will be present at this location. And the dimension of your fuselage pod, if you choose to use a design like I have here where the rubber bands enter the hatch, uh, the dimension between the rear of the hatch and the rear of the actual fuselage itself should also equal to the cord of the wing uh, or very slightly smaller than that. So to assemble this, I would put the joiner plate inside the fuselage pod like this so that the tabs are exposed here in the front. At that point, uh, rubber bands can be placed around those tabs, back over the wing, which is not in place here, and then over the rear tabs right there. You'll see that this small amount of space here is acquired by tapering that uh, plate in the front, such as by sanding here and sanding here. I usually like to use uh, three rubber bands per side over the wing, of course, and ultimately it will look like this. So the fuselage serves to hold the plate into the plane and the wing onto the plane. But with the benefit of in a crash, uh, if anything shifts, if the wing shifts forward, it will disengage that rubber band. And if the pod shifts, or if the boom shifts forward relative to the pod on a frontal impact, it will disengage the rubber band and absorb some of that shock and movement there. This can also be disassembled for transport. Moving back, we have the servo mounting apparatus that you see here, which I've elected to mount pretty close to the fuselage pod as that helps distribute the weight of the servos. These are nine gram size metal gear servos. They actually weigh 19 grams each, but as close as possible to the center of gravity, which will fall about here. Now there's nothing wrong with mounting the servos towards the rear, but you have the additional weight of the servo extensions. And of course the weight of the servos further back on the tail moment, 
which produces a down going force on the tail, which you must balance with more weight in the front of the aircraft here. So while the corner guard uh, plastic stuff can work fine, this, it's a little bit flexy. So I've elected to use some uh, angle aluminum also acquired from Home Depot. And this happens to be the kind that's asymmetrical. It's half an inch in this dimension, three quarters of an inch in this dimension, and it accepts these servos very nicely. Note that the alignment is important for your uh, push rod guides here right to the servo arms here. There shouldn't be any or much of a bend here. And the benefit of this um, technique is it allows you to slide the servo up or down to accomplish that alignment. These servos are attached to this aluminum by two-sided 3M foam heavy-duty mounting tape, and then a zip tie is placed around. Uh, two holes are placed here and here to allow that zip tie to go around and back through the hole. And that hole also serves as a pathway for the zip tie that goes around the uh, otherwise thin and round carbon fiber tube here. Additional two-sided foam tape is placed in the channel as well. So uh, this is a really relatively strong attachment and is very strong to the, to the anti-torsion that's needed to stabilize the servo from rotating this way and that against the mount. Also take care to ensure the alignment of your push rods on the vertical view axis here so that those go straight in. So choose the right length of servo arm and the correct hole so that it goes right in. Additionally, the spacing between the servo arm and the push rod guide here should allow what little bit of flexion needs to occur like that uh, without unduly stressing the tip of this uh, push rod guide or without being so long that the push rod could deflect. I've not experienced any problem having the forward and the rear push rods interfere here as long as the Z bends are made above the push rods. And otherwise this, which is the rudder servo push rod, seems to slide uh, freely back and forth in relation to the elevator uh, servo arm attachment point here. The push rod guide itself can be made from a number of materials, but I choose this uh, carbon fiber tube. It's three millimeters also from Radical RC, which was about $4 and they have a number of uh, sizes for this as well. Uh, it's thin and light and useful for a number of purposes, but for this uh, push rod guide, I have initially zip tied it to the top of the carbon fiber tail boom until the plane was flight tested and everything was secure and centered, then just dribbled a little CA glue between it and the main carbon fiber tail boom here. I think it just fits in nicer with the theme to have two pieces of carbon fiber and it plausibly provides a little bit of vertical stiffness um, being that it's stacked carbon fiber tubes. For push rods, I'm using a 0.032 or 32 thousandths of an inch, which is about 0.8 millimeters uh, music wire from Radical RC uh, in the plane I've just showed you. And in some cases, I'll just mention, I use this 0.047 thousandths of an, or 47 thousandths of an inch, which is about 1.2 millimeters from Radical RC. Um, comes in three foot lengths. It's well under a dollar a piece, very handy to have. Uh, the smaller is flimsy, but does well in push rod guides. And the larger diameter is good for up to about a six inch span for direct push rod without a guide. So some of each of these is a staple of Experimental Airlines designs. And finally, moving back to perhaps the most challenging part of this engineering is the attachment of the vertical and horizontal stabilizers to your tail boom, because you have a lot of moving parts here and need to provide good alignment of your push rods and the push rod guide to your control horns for your uh, rudder and elevator here. The simplest version of this is to just cut a section of the corner guard to a certain length to accept the vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, and accommodate the tail boom in the angle like this. A slight modification of that is to cut a, a relief for the vertical stabilizer, which is here, versus the horizontal stabilizer down here and slightly offset forward, and consequently to cut a relief for the rudder to articulate here behind the vertical stabilizer. But this sim similarly accepts the tail boom right in the angle like this. And then a third version involves cutting the corner guard in thirds on one side and then bending one of the members vertically. That allows the tail boom to reside below the horizontal stabilizer, which is advantageous in some ways, uh, but causes some other challenges, which I'll show you. Alternately with this design, you can cut it in thirds, bend up, and then remove the unused section of the corner guard so that only a, a small strip of plastic remains that more or less matches the diameter of your tail boom like this. Additionally, that corner guard is nice to cut out control horns like this just by cutting out a section, tapering it if you like, and then drilling the hole. And I like to use a piece of the actual uh, push rod like this, cut off with dikes to provide a little chisel tip, and then chuck it up in a Dremel tool just so you can drill your hole right through the uh, 
control horn like that, and it's the perfect size. This layout provides the best possible alignment of the push rod straight from the push rod guide back to the control horns of the rudder and the elevator here. As you can see from the horizontal view and the vertical view, it's a straight shot, which is advantageous. The disadvantages of this are that the vertical stabilizer is offset slightly to the side and must be offset forward to allow articulation of the elevator behind it. Typically, I would cut off a wedge of the rudder to allow this articulation. However, that would require placing the control horn up higher and provide a bend from the pushrod guide up to that point. Whereas placing the um, control horn down low at the bottom of the rudder provides a straight shot of that pushrod. So therefore, very unlikely to flex here uh, in tension or in pushing. And that allows the pushrod guide itself to be terminated as far back as possible um, up to about an inch from the control horn itself because a small amount of flex is required as the uh, rudder articulates back and forth and to a lesser degree the elevator. This example uses a piece of corner guard cut like this and you can see how that would overlay right here to match the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer and then to terminate just forward of the elevator where it attaches. And this is affixed to the uh, vertical and horizontal stabilizer by two-sided foam tape here and here. And then as a safety measure, zip ties or safety wire may be applied around the tail boom here and here at this discontinuity right here and right here with small holes drilled in this location and in this location and then wrapped around the tail boom. Unfortunately, this does not provide any tail boom or other protective surface below the horizontal stabilizer. Therefore, I'd recommend adding a skid or a gift card or at least some reinforced tape there unless you're landing on the very softest of grass at all times. Another design which does provide some protection on the lower surface of the horizontal stabilizer is the cutting of the corner guard like this, which provides two tabs to which the horizontal stabilizer attaches, again with two-sided foam tape, and then the third bent tab which is placed up through a slot in the horizontal stabilizer to engage the vertical stabilizer here, also with two-sided foam tape, and then this example covered with vinyl tape. Also, you see that the leading edge and trailing edge of the vertical and horizontal stabilizers are aligned with one another, which requires cutting a relief wedge out of the rudder so that the elevator can move. Uh, but this unfortunately raises the control horn of the rudder such that it makes a bend from the pushrod guide to its attachment point. I put some small uh, carbon fiber tubing over that, which works decent to stiffen this, but there is still a little bit of flex. In tension, that is pulling of the pushrod, which is up elevator in this example and left rudder, uh, there's no detriment at all, but in pushing, which is not common in elevator, but certainly in the rudder, uh, there can be some uh, flex in that push rod if the length is too long and or the diameter is too small. For this discus launch glider, there are four separate mounting points against this six millimeter carbon fiber rod from Radical RC, and I've used a blend of uh, straight right angles uh, trim to match the diameter of the carbon fiber tube and also a doubly bent uh, channel style like this, where this leg is simply bent over to about 90 degrees. And then depending on the forces applied to the particular structure attached to the tail boom, um, this will allow more gluing surface and strength. So take, going from the back, the vertical stabilizer is uh, CA glued right to the tail boom, which is in fact the entire fuselage of this plane, um, just with a simple right angle. The horizontal stabilizer, which is uh, mounted with an offset to permit some slight downgoing elevator action and also is conceivably subject to more stress upon launching. Um, this is channeled over so that there's a surface here, here, and here uh, to which the um, horizontal stabilizer is glued, but at least a 90 degree angle that allows the uh, tail boom to be glued. Uh, this uses a pull-pull mechanism with fishing line uh, with sort of a double control horn on both the horizontal and vertical stabilizer here. And those pole-pole uh, lines are routed through uh, carp or, uh, coffee stir sticks just for lightness, taped to the fuselage. Onto the wing mounting, this uses the channel style, which allows gluing on three surfaces here, here, and here for extra strength. And the wing will be attached here. And then finally, at the nose, we have the servos the receiver and the uh, battery, which is a single cell and a voltage booster to five volts, 
all attached by a piece of corner guard, which is trimmed to size, and arranged in such a way that the lateral forces unlaunch that way, unlaunching the discus launch glider, uh, will tend to, if anything, snug that piece of corner guard more closely against the carbon fiber tube. In this earlier version, uh, I've used a sort of a brute force approach in which I'd used a straight piece of corner guard here and epoxied, although I don't recommend epoxy, it tends not to cling well to the corner guard, especially when cold, but rather two-sided foam tape or other uh, secure adhesive. And I've put, put some safety screws here just for security. Uh, this is a fiberglass uh, fishing rod actually I used just because I had it and also needed a particular interior diameter to accept the servo extension connectors. Otherwise, I would vastly have preferred to use 10 uh, millimeter carbon fiber tube uh, if not needed for the internal diameter. But in any case, this is uh, attached to the tail boom. The horizontal stabilizer is attached to the corner guard with two-sided foam tape. This provides uh, somewhat of a skid uh, for high angle of attack approaches and landings. On the top, two additional pieces of short corner guard were taped to the horizontal and vertical stabilizer, which provides a stiffening effect for the vertical stabilizer, as well as a mounting point for the servos, which are themselves taped to the corner guard to with two-sided foam tape on this surface and the lower surface, which gives a very strong resistance to torsion um, w upon articulation of the rudder and the elevator. So hopefully that'll give you some good ideas where to start with the carbon fiber tail boom concept and building your own plane like this. Be sure to check out the selection of carbon fiber tubes at Radical RC and grab yourself some for your next project.